Our next panel will be moderated by um, Bill Flanagan from the Allegheny Conference, and it's about the lure of the Berg, why, pe why people either stayed here or came here with their businesses. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Meg said, and thanks for the introduction, my name's Bill Flanagan. I'm with the Allegheny Conference, and for those of you who don't know the organization, it is an economic and community development organization, been around 70 years, that serves 10 counties uh, of southwestern Pennsylvania. The conference was a major player uh, half a century ago during what's now known as Renaissance One. I also do double duty uh, with the Allegheny Conference. I host a show on Channel 11, Sunday mornings at 11 on WPXI called Our Region's Business. And so what I've spent my entire career here in Pittsburgh, and that's now about 30 years, is, is really talking about our region's business. What's going, very broadly defined, what's happening here in terms of the changing economy, the changing quality of life, and the changing sense of opportunity we have here in the region. And I'm chatting a little bit like this because we're all getting mics on to swap over the panels here, so I'm buying a little time until I see the panelists uh, come over and sit down. But I'll tell you as they get settled, if anything, I kind of question the title for this panel, which is The Lure of the Bird. Because I've lived in Pittsburgh now 30 years, and I'm on my third cycle of Pittsburgh poised to take off, poised to really begin to become a globally successful and globally recognized place. I came here in the 1980s. It was Renaissance II. And, uh, and uh, a few years after I got here, we were named America's most livable city. And then the bottom fell out with the collapse of the steel industry. And we all had to regroup in the early 1990s. And we placed a big bet on innovation. And we placed a big bet on Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, began to grow our innovation and tech-based economy. And we were doing really well. And by the end of the 90s, we had great big IPOs and exits. And they were companies like Free Markets and Four Systems. And it looked like we were paused to go again. This was going to be our moment. We were going to become the next Seattle or Portland. And then came the dot-com bust and the collapse of that part of our economy, and another restructuring, and another redo, another rebuild, another reset. And so here we are again, about uh, 15 or so years later, uh, once again poised for incredible success. And, and I'm getting very excited about it, because that's part of what we do in economic development. We have to get excited. We have to convey enthusiasm. But in the back of my mind are those two other experiences of what I've lived through. And is this the moment when Pittsburgh will remake it? and once again really emerge and be a place that can attract people, that can lure people, or are we, do we, uh, do we have some dangers ahead and some obstacles we have to overcome if we really want to realize this once and for all? And so I was uh, interested in Bill Fuller's comments more about the restaurant scene and the cycles there. But I think we all have to be very aware of the cycles and our vulnerabilities as well as our opportunities as a region. Or to, or to set, put it as uh, Kevin McMahon, uh, the president and CEO of the Cultural Trust told me a few years ago, he said, the biggest danger Pittsburgh faces is beginning to believe our own press clippings. And if we get complacent, because his position is we have not made it, uh, and uh, it's up to us to make sure we don't uh, give up the momentum. So it's great to have the panel that we have here to talk about this, because we have a great, sec a, a great uh, a collection of folks here from a variety of businesses, a lot of perspectives on our region, both its history, kind of where we are now, and more importantly, where we're headed. And, uh, and I couldn't imagine a better group to be able to talk about this issue, but I think primarily from sort of a business perspective and what it's going to take to create that kind of opportunity. So I am not going to spend a lot of time introducing them. What I'm going to do is go right down the line. And since most of them are entrepreneurs, I think they can deliver a 30-second elevator pitch <laughs> about who they are and what their business is all about and why they're in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and I know we've got Marley down on the end, who, who has been fostering entrepreneurship for a generation here in Pittsburgh. We've got an academic on the end of the line. Hopefully, you guys are up to a 30-second elevator Absolutely. pitch, too. I'll so with that, Charlie Batch, we'll start with you and go right down the line. I'm Charlie Batch. Most people know me as that person that used to play for the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> but I'm no longer that anymore. Um, right now, uh, what we are, I've created a startup, which is called Impelia. And basically, what we do is help universities commercialize some of their technology. And we focus on performance, health, uh, performance, wellness, uh, injury prevent, prevention, and those are some of the things that really would get, we became excited about during my time. Uh, and especially uh, as, an, as an athlete, I was injured a lot throughout the course of my career, and we were privy to a lot of cool technology that just wasn't available to the general public. So what we've done is kind of create a niche and hopefully bring that to the forefront and allow uh, just the general public to be able to experience some of those technologies. All right, next up, another entrepreneur. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Avi Geller. Um, I've been in Pittsburgh for a year and a half. Uh, I, I, a little bit about myself. I grew up in uh, the Silicon Valley. I went to MIT for computer science. I lived uh, overseas for about 10 years. And then I came to Pittsburgh to found a company called Maven Machines. Uh, we make uh, headsets and mobile technology for the trucking industry, keeping truck drivers safe on the road and, and everybody else who shares the roads with them. And uh, started the company on my own, and now we're 10 people going strong and having a great time in the city. Avi, and I will come back to ask you what brought a West Coast guy to Pittsburgh to start his business. But first, Helen what? Hanna Casey. I'm Helen Hanna Casey, and I'm president of Howard Hanna Real Estate. Service is a three-generation family firm that chose to stay in Pittsburgh, chose to start here and stay here. Um, and um, we're in eight states and have 7,000 employees. Uh, and um, so we have a pretty good idea of what people want to, why they want to live in Pittsburgh as opposed to Rochester or Detroit, et cetera. Unless you think that a real estate company is sort of an old line business, ha Howard Hanna has been a real leader in terms of the adoption of technology in that industry as well. So I think, Helen, you can wear a couple of hats, entrepreneurship. Yeah, first website for real estate that put every listing on. There you go. All right. Another first for Pittsburgh. Yeah. We love that. Okay. Don Charles. Hey, everybody. I'm Don Charles, and I'm the founder of a technology company here in Pittsburgh called Jazz. Some of you might have heard of us as the Resumator. The the was part of the name back in the day. I don't know why. Um, but um, what we are is uh, really a pioneer in uh, bringing recruiting tools to the small business market. So we have about 2,400 customers today. Companies like everything from Instagram to companies you've never heard of have used our software to do recruiting. Um, and I, um, I'm a Fayette County, I was born in Fayette County. I went to uh, Rochester Institute of Technology up in Rochester, came back to the big city, which was Pittsburgh at the time in 1999. I've been here since. Very good. Thanks, Don. Marley. I'm Marley Myers. I'm a lawyer at a firm called Morgan Lewis. I've been working with startups in Pittsburgh for more than 35 years before entrepreneurship was a word <laughs> and have seen the waves. Uh, I also uh, in, was personally involved in an incredible entrepreneurial endeavor with Meg Cheever in founding the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, which has just done awesome work in improving the green spaces, the most democratic spaces in our city. I have been so excited listening to the panels today. I have to tell you that this is real today. It's not that the earlier waves weren't real. Those companies did go public. There were people who got rich. But today, things have changed in this city, the food scene the green spaces, the universities, the entrepreneurial energy around the startups that I'm feeling as I listen to these panels. I spend a week a month in the San Francisco Bay Area, and even people there, like Paul Graham and others, have started to notice us. So no, we're not perfect. We have a long way to go. We need to improve on diversity. We need to improve on transportation. Um, we need to get more money into our startups, but you know what? We're on the way. I'm very excited. Very good. Okay, Jim Russell, we'll let you be the judge of that, the guy from Cleveland State University. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, I'm Jim Russell. I'm a geographer at the Center for Population Dynamics at Cleveland State University. And uh, what I do is sell Pittsburgh as the model for economic revitalization. Uh, uh, most recently, I'm working in Cleveland. I don't tell them that Pittsburgh's the model. <laughs> they wouldn't listen to me if I did. Uh, but uh, you might be interested to know one city that just went head over heels for the Pittsburgh model is San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and uh, Graham Weston, founder and CEO of Rackspace, was one who was most interested and brought me back to talk to the business community there. And when I presented all that went on in Pittsburgh, they were wowed. They didn't believe it. They're like, you sure? And it's like, this is the data. This is Pittsburgh. Get used to it. Well, I'm sorry. Well, thank you so much. And I'll tell you, Cleveland State is one of my most reliable resources when I want data about Pittsburgh. Because I <laughs> figure if, if, if Cleveland says it, it must be true. <laughs> right? I agree with that. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, let's start first with our, with our entrepreneurs and our business owners here, in, in particular a little bit more about kind of what Pittsburgh offers them. And I can't imagine a better place to start than with Avi, who is not from here, who is from the West Coast and somehow found your way here to start your business. How did that happen? And why are you still here? Yeah, um, well, it wasn't by design, to be honest. Um, what I, I was living in Boston, 
about uh, two years ago, and I was looking for a place to start the company that I was going to start. I didn't have a name for it yet. And I knew I wanted to get into an accelerator program or an incubator. And I looked at, there's Techstars and Y Combinator, and in Boston there's Mass Challenge, and a place called Bolt, and H Accelerator, and Highway One, and there's lots and lots of programs. And then uh, somehow somebody told me about uh, this city called Pittsburgh and this program called Alpha Lab Gear. And I didn't really know much about either. So I came out to Pittsburgh and, uh, and I started meeting people and started learning about the city. And I saw Alpha Lab Gear over in East Liberty and I saw the companies that had just finished the first cycle of Alpha Lab Gear. And I saw the people running the program and from organizations like Innovation Works. And, and I said, wow, what an, just a hidden gem. This is, this is a place where I can, I can really get a company off the ground. Um, and I jumped all over it from, you know, for all the reasons that we know, the universities that are here, the, the cost of living, um, the fact that Google had opened an office and there was discussions about a second one and things like that. Um, and, and despite f personal situations with my wife uh, getting a degree in Boston, and I was going back and forth from Pittsburgh to Boston. Despite these kinds of hardships, it was uh, something that was very obvious to me that uh, that was a great opportunity. And, and it's been phenomenal for the last year and a half, uh, getting fundraising, getting customers, getting talent for the company, and I think this is just the beginning. Yeah, do you think you're going to stay? We've, we've lost some promising startups in Pittsburgh over the years. No, we're definitely staying. Um, the, the resources here from you know Pitt and Carnegie Mellon and other universities, uh, the proximity, so we're in the trucking business. Um, and I know there's been a lot of talk at the airport during this conference. Uh, I would love to be able to fly for $50 to, you know, two-hour flights to anywhere from Chicago to D.C. to Philly to Boston to New York to the Carolinas to uh, you know, Indiana to Arkansas. To, these are all flights that uh, you, know, you should be able to, that sh should be taken off every 15 minutes uh, around the clock. Uh, um, so we're near our customer base is what I'm trying to say. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, there, there's so much here and it's definitely a city that's on the rise and, and we want to be a part of that. Very cool. Well, Don Charles, you, you went away and you came home. So, uh, you know, what brought you back here to start the business and why does it make sense to be here? And what changed since you left, too, I guess? Well, I, I was college whenever I left, but we actually, we actually opened up a San Francisco office and now we have a Boston office as well. Um, it's interesting, I actually came out of the Alpha Lab program as well. Uh, we were class two and today they have Alpha Lab in an auditorium. It was in Alpha Lab whenever they had demo day. <laughs> about demo day is what I'm talking about. And um, it was in, it's interesting because now, yeah, hundreds of people turned out at stage AE for demo day. Yeah, they, they, they were, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, there were more pitches than there were uh, investors at, at <laughs> demo day. So um, what's interesting though is that seven years ago, and um, it's amazing how how dramatic the change has been in terms of an interest in Pittsburgh and entrepreneurialism, especially. especially startup entrepreneurialism. And when I, when I say startup entrepreneurialism, I think too often, um, obviously, I think people focus on tech startups, but I think entrepreneurialism in general, I think is, um, is on the rise. Especially, you know, I speak to most Alpha Lab groups um, every year or every, at least once a year. And um, the questions used to be very basic. And now the questions are much more sophisticated because I think the overall IQ of Pittsburgh and um, especially young people in terms of the idea that they can go out and start their own business is much higher now. So I think that's the biggest thing that I've, the biggest change that I've seen since then. And um, I still think that there is a, there's a fundamental challenge that Pittsburgh has right now, which is that, you know, the Glenn Meekums and the four systems folks of the world, I mean, they're either pushing into 40s or 50s. That's generation, generation two of the generation two. Of entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. So the, the, I think the biggest challenge that we see to maintaining strong, even tech-centric tech entrepreneur or, or, or companies in Pittsburgh is there is a gap in terms of um, the right profile of person with the right domain expertise um, of 40, uh, uh, early, uh, mid 30s to mid 40s, maybe they made half a million or a million dollars at a previous company. This is kind of the, you, you know these people out in Silicon Valley, they see their friends move out because Twitter went public and they think that person's a bum. It, there's this kind of natural energy to want to be successful and, on, and people who are just outside of that bubble of, or, or that wave of entrepreneurial success. And I think tapping into those people, I think is really the next challenge of Pittsburgh is 
quite frankly, I think we are the people that are going to be those 35 to, four, I'm 38, so I'm like right in the middle. Right? <laughs> You're on the bubble. Yeah. yeah, of people who are going to be the next wave that really is going to cre continue this ongoing cycle of entrepreneurial um, success. And well, it is a demographic, and I, well, I'm going to ask you to build on that in a second, but it is a demographic challenge for our region. You know, as everybody hopefully knows, we have lots of baby boomers here, right? And that population is actually growing. Uh, we also have a lot of millennials, and in fact, we have almost as many millennials as we do baby boomers, and that population is actually growing faster than the national average. Mm -hmm. But if you look at Gen X, the group in between, the group you were just talking about, uh, we're missing 86,000 people from the baby boom population to the Gen X group, almost 90,000 delta there, and our population of Gen X is declining, actually going down out of all those population groups in the region. So it's one of the statistics at the conference we really think a lot about. But I wonder, Marley, we are missing sort of that cohort of the old hands who've made a big buck and are prepared to invest and nurture these other companies, are we not? Well, you know, I think money is an issue here, money for investment. If you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have answered this question differently. 10 years ago, I would have said, Money is the most fungible of commodities. It doesn't matter where it originates from. It'll find the best companies to invest in. But what's happened, I think, in the most recent wave of startups, particularly in the Bay Area, which swallows a lot of the venture money that gets invested every year, is that there's so many targets of opportunity for the big venture funds there in their own backyard that a lot of them are not interested in looking across the country and having to take a red eye to, to take a look at a startup. So I would love to see more local sources of money. I would love to see more interest by the people who have made money. And there is a cohort of people who have made money here investing. There is more angel investing. I think Avi was telling me his company is funded by angels. I met two other amazing entrepreneurs today who have angel funding for their companies. So I don't think the glass is half empty. I think it might only be half full, though. And I also think that that generation that didn't come home is the generation that grew up in the darkest days of Pittsburgh's last 50 years. And so they left and they made their lives elsewhere, whereas baby boomers, you know, for a variety of reasons, each has our own, have stayed here, and younger people are seeing a fantastic place to live for all the reasons other panelists have cited. Yeah, that's a good point. I came here as a reporter and stayed on because this turned out to be the most amazing business story to cover in the United States over the course of the last 25 or 30 years. And it just, I wanted to see how it all turned out. And I'm, I'm still waiting to see. Charlie, so you're a native. You grew up here, plays for the Steelers. And then you go into, a, a, you know, a medical-oriented uh, startup. So I guess, number one, how did that journey happen? And second, where are you finding the money to invest in these promising <laughs> technologies that are coming out of Pitt and the other folks? Well, I think, here? well, one thing about the National Football League and the collective bargaining agreement, as a player, you don't want to get injured. But when you do get injured, you are entitled to a second opinion. What was happening, the players from Pittsburgh were flying other places to get a second opinion, but the other 31 teams were flying into Pittsburgh to get their second opinion. <laughs> so why is that? Okay, okay. So I figured out a way, just talking and throwing ideas out there, and eventually I figured out a way to work with the researchers and the doctors here at the University of Pittsburgh. And it was an exciting opportunity because over time, and my conversations, and I know Audrey Rooster is in here somewhere. She got probably tired of me talking to her about this. There she is in the back. I see you back there, Audrey. Um, <laughs> but we talked about some of the things that could potentially happen, and she helped me make the connections. And it started here with the University of Pittsburgh. And from there, one conversation turned into another. And the next thing you know, uh, two years later, we finally were uh, awarded a license here with the university. It was um, a long process. It wasn't easy. But getting to that point, and that means they believed in the model that we had. And from that particular uh, situation, we now partner with 12 universities throughout the country. But I wanted to start it here because I knew this is where home was. This is where home was going to be for me. I'm born and raised in Homestead, five, ten minutes from here. And I knew this was going to be the base, and it was an opportunity there. Uh, but when you talk about finding the money, I mean, as an athlete, you know, you're driven and you're passionate about some of the things that you're doing. But when you go out here and meet with people, I'm not used to being told no. And I had to humble myself. 
because I believed in the idea, but somebody else did. And next thing you know, it was more and more uh, conversations, and eventually there was, a, there was a yes. And then we started talking, and, and next thing it started uh, snowballing, which was very favorable for us. So we just were excited about that. I just wonder, being a former football player, is that is that a, a, it, it's helpful. I'm sure it can get you in the door. It can get you a meeting. But does it also increase the level of skepticism as to whether you're, re I mean, you're in the medical, you know, technology right. business? It does. I mean, the name gets you in the door. It, ha it helps expedite it. But obviously, you need to know what you're talking about. And as soon as people uh, get there, the first five minutes, they want to know who your team is, who's your board, who, who is all part of this team to help make that happen. And when we put the names up there and people look and see who, are, who we're affiliated with, people start saying, okay, maybe this guy knows what he's talking about. And, you know, with that, you know, we've been able to, um, get into some major publications uh, talking about some of the space that we're in and that was just something that you know it, it took time to do but at that point and just making sure that we had the right team behind me. Yeah, I, Helen you see this from a variety of perspectives you're clearly you're an employer you run a very entrepreneurial business but you're also welcoming people to the region and getting them situated so what do you see about the dynamic that is play here that everybody else has been talking? We're talking a lot about individuals and, and startups and why people want to live here but there's an interesting fact you, Another reason why we have that lost generation in Pittsburgh is because Pittsburgh was driven in the 60s and the 70s by big corporate relocations where they moved people all over the place. And this was such an incredible corporate city here that people were always coming in. That stopped virtually in the late 80s and the 90s, not just in Pittsburgh, everywhere. Companies no longer paid $75,000 to move somebody from Cincinnati to Pittsburgh. They figured out other ways to do it. So we lost generations that way plus those people that left. So you have to look at what corporations are looking for today. And I think that's something that we think was a big advantage, especially in housing. It's obviously what I know. Everybody likes to say our housing is such a great buy. But if you're a corporation looking to transfer people here, it isn't necessarily a great buy. Because our taxes for properties in the state of Pennsylvania, how they're weighted, are much more than many other states. You can have the same house here, for an example, if you were to buy a house here for $100,000, you're looking at uh, $3,000 taxes, doesn't sound bad, but in other markets that might be $2,500 taxes, $1,200 taxes, and the higher you get, on average here a million dollar house is $33,000 in Western Pennsylvania taxes. Pretty, pretty amazing when you think about that. So when you look at corporations, they're looking at that overall package. They're looking at taxation. They're looking at the wage taxes in the city of Pittsburgh as opposed to the next township over. They're looking at the county as to the next county. I also think um, those employers that are looking to open here are looking for what else we have besides restaurants. They're looking for places to move their people into. Do we have pad ready sites, which we don't always. We think we do, but you've got somebody coming here, and this is what Bill does this all the time. They go to, he goes to China, he goes all over the world to do this. Um, I only do it nationally. But when you look at those corporations, they want that. They want to see housing stock. They want to see some place to move their people, whether it's inside an office building, whether it's a warehouse. So they want all the energy for, we provide, but they also want an identity for themselves. And I think that's incredibly important as we drive people here. How do we create that identity for them? Um, in a world where uh, Pittsburgh was a corporate city, and if you drive downtown, it's so great because you see great big, I happen to love those big signs. UPMC can have any sign downtown they want because that's jobs. And in the end, jobs is what drives this. Jobs drives it. I would also say that money drives it. Funding for venture capital, and we talk about Cleveland, is much greater in Cleveland than it is here. Um, uh, we have a technology business which we bought, which is in Denver of all places. Um, and uh, trying to get the people that live there to move here. They're not worried about restaurants, they are worried about air quality, by the way, but, um, but so you look at all that when you're driving people to come here. So it's not just individuals wanting to live here. The other issue that we have for those individuals is housing stock. That the housing prices might be great themselves, but we do not have enough housing diversity. Right now, Pittsburgh was just named one of the top 10 cities last year for first time buyers. Almost 50% of the first time, were first time buyers in Pittsburgh, in the city of Pittsburgh last year. That's a pretty overwhelming number, 46.5. Incredible. But the housing stock that they need isn't available because we don't have housing stock for the people above them to move into. We don't offer, well, 
what I refer to as right sizing, not empty nesting or downsizing, but right sizing for people that want something else. We're only offering right now, we're offering a lot of wonderful rentals and we're offering a lot of flat condominiums, but we don't have other lifestyle options for them except for them to leave the city, again, because the land isn't there. So all of those things, I think, combine right, to make why people live here. So when we look at what we have to offer, we have to offer those things. And finally, transportation isn't just air. I'd also like to add it's buses and it's, it is the local transportation too that not everybody's on a bike, but that we have to have better transportation to get people from downtown to Oakland, to Shadyside, to wherever they go. We hear that a lot in economic development, the, the fragmentation uh, in, our, in our transportation system within the region that keeps people from getting to opportunity and keeps their businesses from their customers. Is, is really challenging, and it's across the economy in so many different regions as well, in so many different industries as well as, uh, as well as neighborhoods and particular populations, Jim. So, Jim, I'll let you, before we go, hopefully have a time for two or three questions, so your perspective on, you, you hold us up as a great example, but what do we need to do better to build on what we've got so this doesn't become just the third failed wave of Pittsburgh Renaissance? Sure. Uh you know, uh, I'm actually working very closely with Cleveland in this regard, and, and a lot of what we do is look at models of cities further along the line. So uh, we chose Boston, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland. So Cleveland's, uh, you know, just the beginning of watching these forces of globalization unleash itself in the city. Pittsburgh's sort of right in the middle, and Boston is completely baked, all done, you know, and, and you see the inequality and things like that. Uh, and what I'm most pleased to hear is, uh, you know, and the mayor taking a leadership role on this is saying, we are not managing decline, we are managing growth. And that's really important because Baltimore missed the boat on this. There's lots of growth that happened there and Johns Hopkins was a great driver of that. And uh, instead of getting in at the ground floor and making sure that there was opportunity for everyone in the community, it was more like, wow, we finally have a boom, and let's ride that wave. And, uh, and what we're busy doing is telling Cleveland, I know you're upset about the population loss. I know uh, there's a sense of Rust Belt shame, as we like to call it. Uh, but you have a boom on your hands. And if you don't move very quickly, you're going to have a massive inequality problem on your hands, and you're going to have a lot of people locked out from opportunity. Uh, and, and so Pittsburgh's right in that area where I'm like, is it too late? Is there enough time? Uh, I, you know, I think you need to wrap your head around that this is full on growth. This is the final wave. You've made it, uh, you can ride it, or is it gonna wipe you out? And, uh, and I think you know, uh, a discussion like this is perfectly timed, that uh, we can think about things we can do better but I think it's more critical that we talk about how we become more inclusive in opportunities. Uh, you know, just listening about the housing, it's hard to wrap your head around high vacancy rate and unaffordable housing in the same, like one neighborhood next to another, or sometimes within the same neighborhood. There's no filtering going on. Uh, seeing the same thing in Cleveland, you can buy a $30,000 home or a $300,000 home. There's nothing in the middle for first time buyers. It's a housing shortage. Buffalo was just listed as having one of the most acute housing shortages in the country. Buffalo. And their population went down in the last census. So reconcile that. Uh, I think we look at other pieces of data and we miss the boom. And the next thing you know, you're looking around. Oh, it's happening. I was seeing the seeds of Pittsburgh's uh, revitalization 2002, 2003. I was like, oh, it's starting to happen. And what you're seeing now is people looking around and saying, oh, I can see the cranes. Well, it was showing up in the data. It was just you had to dig a little bit to find yeah. it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because you know, for 25 years, the organization I worked for, was, it was all about just creating jobs. We got, it, we got all these unemployed people. We got to create enough jobs to just put people to work. Mm -hmm. And that was the entire focus. And then about five years ago, during our planning process, our members began to say, wait a minute. We're doing OK economically right now. We're getting concerned about the people that have been left behind and you, the Allegheny Conference, need to start focusing more on that issue, and it's just what you're talking about. But I've wondered the same thing. Are we actually a little too late to the table? Has so much momentum begun to build that the market has taken hold? And then yeah. once the market's got it, 
it's, it's, it's the challenge. That's what I, mean, I talked to housing advocates in Baltimore, and I said, if there was one thing you could do, what would you do? And they say, if we can get in before the real estate developers and the landlords get in, we, we can succeed. Problem is, everywhere where we should have gone in, it, they're already there. And can you tell us where they're gonna go next? And I was like, if I could do that, I'd probably be making my money in a different way. Yeah, he would not be working for the person. <laughs> Maybe time for one or two questions. We got only a minute or so, but anybody have a question or a comment or a thought for, uh, for the panelists here? Right there. Yeah, anybody at all? Yeah, right here, yeah. All right, good. If nobody else, we got one volunteer. <laughs> Yeah, I've asked a few questions, so I don't want to dominate, but the, um, I'm curious to know, in particular, I'm, I'm working on environmental issues, and I see that the, um, I was at COP21 in Paris last December, where they talked about getting to staying below 2 degrees C or 1.5 C, and those are monumental challenges on an international scale, and possibly a vital opportunity for Pittsburgh, particularly considering that its infrastructure is, has, uh, was sort of a pre fossil fuel density level. So we have a unique opportunity as sea levels rise on the coasts to embrace new populations, but also to embrace the technologies that will help us stay below 1.5 or 2C above pre-industrial levels of warming. I wondered if you could speak to the growth opportunities for Pittsburgh around climate change related industries. Anybody want to take that? Anybody have any thoughts? I mean, uh, I, mean I guess in one regard is we're looking at issues of say water uh, and oh, there was a little bit of buzz uh, not too long ago about, oh, well, everyone's going to migrate to the Great Lakes region because that's where all the water is, or they're all going to migrate to west of the Cascades in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and that's all well and good, but if we actually get to that point of that there's that kind of massive migration, we'd failed already. Uh, we missed the boat. I think what you see here uh, is all the innovation that's going on. And so if someone brings up a problem like air quality, and it resonates with everyone, they get it. And then you have these great research universities such as Pitt and CMU, and you purpose them toward those ends. It's just a matter of making it a priority. And I think of Pittsburgh as a leader, not just even on environmental issues, but any sort of issues that you could face. It's been remarkable to watch the entire community, including the universities, rally around that and bring world-class minds to those problems. Maybe, I think, unfortunately, man, we could keep going. This has been really terrific, but how about a round of applause for our panel? Thank you so much.